And greetings everyone, I'm Mar, and once again this is my opinion. With the classic NES being my first gaming console, and my love of classic horror, it may surprise many of you that I didn't grow up playing the Castlevania games. While I knew of them, my first direct experience was the PlayStation's Symphony of the Night. While it's been years and I still need to complete the game, it gave me a taste of why people love the series. Years later, James Rolfe's series retrospective did this one better, dictating why fans love the series. Like other popular game series, an adaptation was inevitable. The question was, what medium would the adaptation hit? Film was the obvious choice, but thankfully it went the series route instead. While that doesn't play a huge role initially, later on it will. Debuting on Netflix on July 7, 2017, Castlevania adapts the plot of the third NES game, modifying it for a new generation and audience. As a newish fan, what did I think of the show? So far, I love it. While I had watched some clips before Marathon watching Season 1, I went into the show with only minor spoilers and basic knowledge of Part 3's plot. As such, I cannot speak for how well it adapts the early game. That said, from what I do know it adapts the game well. Any modifications are done to satisfy the medium change and acknowledge the shifting designs brought about by subsequent games. Alucard's design comes to mind. From what I remember of his Part 3 artwork, he looked more like a straightforward D offspring. The show's design takes note from Symphony of the Night while making him appear younger. Dracula is handled well. While he only directly appears in the first episode, his presence is felt throughout, just like the classic games. Like Coppola's film, the Count is depicted as a tragic figure, his dark mindset the result of the loss of his love, Lisa. While they only share one scene, the writing and voice acting sets the foundation for their relationship. We don't need to directly see the progression to know they'll end up together and produce Alucard. Best human vampire romance in ages. The scene where Dracula discovers Lisa is gone tugs at the heart. It's a perfect example of excellent writing and voice acting working in tandem. His heart is broken, and in his grief he's about to unleash hell. Graham McTavish's vocal performance perfectly encapsulates this. From a character standpoint, Dracula's reaction is understandable, but it's not condonable due to its extreme nature. Dracula wants the entire country to suffer for the sins of a few. While his logic of any one of them could have spoken up is partially logical, given how politically powerful the church was during this era, it would have been suicide. I guess Dracula would have preferred a group burning, even Alucard calls him out on it, leading to their scuffle. Dracula's game powers are adapted well. He takes on a demonic face, robed in eldritch hellfire, smoke, and bats. The unleashed hell include blood and carrion rain, and a swarm of hell spawn. The scene doesn't last long, but it's long enough to get the premise across. This is where the show truly earns its R rating. A lesser rating wouldn't have been as impactful. Anyone who says cartoons are just for children need to watch this scene and rethink that statement. Religious persecution and abuse of authority pushes the plot forward, given life in the form of a corrupt bishop and his blade-wielding priests. The bishop truly believes he's God's earthly steward, and thus every action he makes is justified by faith. While I'm not certain how accurate everything is for the story's time and setting, for the fictional world depicted, it works and is handled well. Even one with basic knowledge of history knows that religion, and in this case Christianity, has persecuted people simply for being different, using said differences as sole justification. This phenomena I call othering. When one is othered, especially to the point where the persecuting group views them as subhuman, it becomes easier to hurt them. Lisa's othering is the first main example. Lisa's goal was to be a true doctor using science over superstition to heal. That alone would place Lisa at odds with the church, especially if by doing so Lisa pulled a Galileo and contradicted scripture. Add in her gender and it's no surprise the church had her burned for witchcraft. Heaven forbid a woman contributes to society outside the norm. That leads to ideas and thinking. 
The speakers are another group that are othered, nomadic with ancient knowledge of prophecy and the supernatural. They are shunned by society. Despite this, the speakers remain, doing their best to try and aid the people during Dracula's wrath. This almost leads to their undoing, as their presence and history leads people to blame them for said wrath. The othering begins as whispers, but soon evolves into a full lynch mob. It's only Belmont's intervention that prevents a completed lynching. Speaking of which, Trevor Belmont, the heir and last member of the Belmont family, is also othered. Known for researching and fighting the supernatural, the Belmont family was turned away by the church. As the old saying goes, study evil long enough and one will be corrupted by it. While Trevor hasn't succumbed to evil, that doesn't prevent the people from hating and cursing his line. Like the speakers, they are blamed for the disaster, but theirs is twofold. How Spelmont is blamed for not slaying Dracula and bringing the evil down upon them. When people are afraid, they'll point the finger anywhere. This doesn't stop Trevor from doing his duty. While he comes across as nothing but a drunken shadow of his former self, with moments of lucidity before this, the rally shows Trevor's true nature. Trevor is beaten during a bar fight, threatened several times by the clergy, and risks death for interfering to save the speakers in the city, but he still does so. It is the Belmont way. Trevor rallies the city, saving their souls for the moment. Outside one line about P. Beer and her witchcraft refutation, there's not much for me to say about Sifa other than her status as the group's mage. Debuted excellently in the fourth episode, Sifa aids Trevor in his mission to protect the city. Sifa's casting doesn't feel like spam, requiring focus and hand gestures. One looked like a basic Naruto hand sign, but Sifa's use of the horns made me grin. Given its association with the greater Dracula mythos and warding off the evil eye in Eastern Europe, it is appropriate to use while casting white magic. Alucard is handled just as well as his father. Only shown once before the finale, his awakening is his proper introduction. The audience knows who he is and can presume why he's in the coffin, which amplifies the tension between the Damphir and Trevor. This tension boils over into a fight. Even though I haven't played part 3, this strikes me as a necessary creative liberty. Trevor is tasked to slay vampires and assumes Alucard is his father, while Alucard will not suffer his disrespect. Cathartic for the former and a warm-up for the latter. From the few clips of later episodes I've seen, it could be called a bonding moment, even if it could have ended in genuine bloodshed. Either way, it ends with our party set and on their way to track down and slay the Count. Their initial banter makes my inner LARPer grin, and I look forward to hearing more in the subsequent seasons. I know there's some loving cursing involved. Powerhouse Animation did a great job. Anime inspired like Airbender and Korra, it combines that school with western sensibilities and proportions. The character designs are familiar yet fresh. The lighting and color feel natural, if not stylized when appropriate. Character movement feels natural and fluid, especially during the combat scenes. Alucard in Trevor's battle comes to mind. Each strike feels believable, and Alucard's abilities are portrayed just the right amount. The low blow and bar fight comment are the cherry on top. The demon designs are interesting, striking the right balance of Eldritch creature and biological possibility. Given the supernatural leaning, it leads closer to the former. Each character is cast perfectly. I've already mentioned McTavish's Dracula, but as a whole, he's a perfect embodiment of this version of the Count. While not theatrical like the infamous 90s voice, there's enough emotion and rage to get his Eldritch point across while maintaining humanity. Emily Swallow embodies this latter element as Lisa. Dracula's last anchor to this mortal coil, her voice balances understanding, love, and a yearn for learning. These former two remain even during her death scene, adding a light to her morose fate. Richard Armitage, James Callis, and Alejandra Reynoso are wonderful as our main trio. While they only come together during the third act of the finale, the chemistry and dynamics that will develop between them is already evident. The seed is planted, it just needs further episodes to blossom. Armitage sounds tired and inebriated, yet roguishly dignified. 
That ladder he carries over from Thorn, but doesn't feel like a carbon copy. Callus's delivery is morose, but hopeful. Reynoso is fiery with moments of cool collectivity, fitting giving the elements her character wields. This allows for convincing sarcasm and mature level-headedness. From what I've seen from Season 2, this will play a larger role. Castlevania Season 1 is a well-paced opening salvo for the show. It introduces the antagonist and his super objective, invests the audience and the heroes while setting their journey in motion. While part of me wishes there were one or two more episodes to flush out certain details, like the Drac Lisa romance, their addition might have hurt the pacing. The exposition we hear is the right amount. More might have been on the nose, especially from the religious side. The saying, less is more exists for a reason. Season 2 in Dracula's Lair, here we come. What a terrible night for a curse.